And I think that's the significance, is that uh, the opportunity exists because if you've got a process such as ours that proves that it can make very good quality material... We're talking high purity aluminium today with FYI, the guys from down under up there. And I hadn't even heard about uh, HPA uh, as of last year before I uh, got introduced to FYI and Roli. So Raj, what is it all about? So FYI, as you know, is producing a high purity alumina, which is really going into decarbonizing the world. And why has it become more important over the last few years is because that area and that sector has become more and more important. So in applications such as energy storage, part of that is lithium ion batteries, but energy storage more generally, it has a range of properties that are important. Uh, those properties include high thermal uh, uh, resistance, so it for example, in a lithium ion battery will uh, reduce the chance of battery uh, degradation or indeed uh, battery explosions. But it also acts as a, a separator between the, the two electrodes within a battery. So it, it has those applications, has been in that sort of field for many, many years. But with the explosion of decarbonisation through electric vehicles and other uh, electric uh, and energy storage requirements, it is finding more and more need and more and more usage. The other side of it is very much around our lighting. And so, as you know, in the past, uh, traditional lighting has been incandescent lighting. We're moving more and more to LED lighting, uh, which is uh, saves energy. That requires high purity alumina uh, as a raw material, which goes into making a synthetic sapphire, which is the, the base that you use to make uh, a LED light. So that uh, uh, sector is also taking off in significant ways uh, and is requiring more and more high purity alumina. All right, Rush, uh, picture is totally clear. High purity aluminum, HPA is needed for uh, batteries. It's also needed for LEDs, which are both technologies that will increase in demand in the future. Now, perhaps we can talk about that demand because the HPA market, as, I, as far as I'm aware, isn't that large. So what will this shock in demand uh, do for HPA in the future? So you're right, it, it starts off as a fairly small number, but uh, many of the research companies around the world have uh, done studies and forecasted uh, future requirements. And as I say, if you just think about uh, lithium ion batteries going into electric vehicles alone, the growth of that would be an indicator of the growth of high purity alumina. And so when you do that translation, the research uh, organisations will tell you that the growth is looking something in the order of 20% per annum. So even off a small number, it doesn't take many years for that to become a big number. Uh, and that's the sort of growth that we're building into uh, in terms of uh, our production ambitions at FYI. All right, and a 20% growth in per annum on the demand side is, of course, massive. How does the supply side look like? Yeah, supply is actually very interesting. There's, uh, there are some traditional uh, suppliers who have been around for, for many, many years. And uh, they have a very, in general, old uh, methodology of producing the product. Uh, which is very carbon intensive as well. So uh, they're not necessarily looking to expand those facilities uh, very much because the carbon footprint of those means prohibits them from becoming uh, components for uh, downstream um, uh, products that we've been talking about. There are some emerging opportunities. Um, there's another one here in Australia that has uh, certainly been uh, beginning to produce material, but there's not, and there are a lot of hopefuls out there in the marketplace, but there's not a lot of people who are really getting it right and getting on with it. And I think that's the significance is that uh, the opportunity exists because if you've got a process such as ours that proves that it can make very good quality material, that is a relatively rare uh, phenomenon in the marketplace. Yeah, and talking about the carbon footprint that you just mentioned, was a good news last year when FYI published their ESG score for the first time. And Rolly did mention that you're also looking to progress to uh, improve your score going forward, that you're actually making progress in reducing the carbon footprint of your product. Absolutely. And look, I would say that uh, ESG is 
really embedded in this organisation uh, and in more ways than I've seen in other junior companies in the past. Uh, not only is it something that we're thinking about all the time, we have a board member who is specifically, you know, strong background in ESG. It is something that is uh, pervades the organisation in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect in a junior. And indeed, if I reflect back to my time at Alcoa, uh, I would say that this organisation is further in front in an ESG space than, than they are. And, and that comes back to the ability to be able to build it in from the beginning rather than have to retrofit it uh, as other organisations have to do.